Hello, we're having a tea party. Yes, Aloysius, how many sugars would you like in your tea? 15. Well, why don't I just pour the tea straight into the sugar basin? You're not getting 15 sugars. You can have three. You can have three and that's too many. You have 15 sugars. You will go into a diabetic coma and you're just so not good. There. You and your sugar consumption, you really need to deal with that. Yes. Now, would you like a little cake? A pink one. Okay, well, excuse fingers, here is a pink cake. Now, are you going to be a good little bat and enjoy your cake and enjoy your tea? Yes? While I answer the questions. Yes? Okay, good. Hello. We're having a tea party and, and we're having a tea party to answer some questions that people on the Instagram have asked because La earlier in the week, I asked some people, some of our friends on Instagram to ask us some questions about writing for me to answer at our tea party. Isn't it a splendid tea party? Yes. So we have some questions to ask, uh, to answer. Now, the March Hare has our questions and I'm just going to put my glasses on so I can read them because I, it's in my handwriting and I can't read my handwriting without the glasses. So we're going to start with the glasses. Uh, thank you, March Hare, for looking after my questions. So our first question is from Citrus Snail Jewellery and they ask is it too cliche to start with once upon a time and I would say no you can start something with once upon a time or something very similar to that in fact using fairy tales in adult novels has quite a big tradition and is actually becoming a has has actually got like you know, proper, proper academic -y text written about it. Yes, yes, Aloysius, academic -y text. Yes, so people take it very, very seriously. When I read your question, I thought very much of Jeanette Winterson's first book, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which begins with, like most people, for a long time, I lived with my mother and my fa and father. My mother liked, my father liked to watch the wrestling. My mother liked to wrestle. It didn't matter what. She was in the white corner and that was that. She put out the, the larger sheets on the windiest days. She wanted the Mormons to add, knock at her door. In a labor mill town, in, in, at elections in a labor mill town, she put a picture of the conservative candidate in her window. So that has very much a fairy tale feel to it. If you want to read that, it's Jeanette Winterson, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Jeanette Winterson does use fairy tale feel for a number of books. And if you go across next week and watch Laura Trevelyan's video, she'll talk to you about an Australian writer flies an Australian writer who uses a fairy tale structure to tell her her novels so check that out next week as well but no it's not too cliche but the trick with it is to give it your own twist give it a modern twist make it a modern fairy tale because you're evoking a very large tradition when you do that you are bringing a lot of connotation, so it's never ever going to be just neutral. You do need to be careful about the fact that if you use once upon a time, then definitely people are going to be expecting a fairy tale. But modern fairy tales, very fun, very usable. You, yes, I would certainly feel free to play with that if I were you. Now, from Katia Zeluk, she asks, how do I end my story? That's a good question. A lot of people have trouble with endings, probably because 
there really aren't any endings in life. And happy endings are, are something that sometimes only happen if you know where to end it. And same with sad endings, they can only hap sometimes happen only when you know where you end it. So endings are a bit arbitrary. But when it comes to endings, think about this. Did the problems that I started with at the beginning of my story, have they been resolved? Have all the problems in my story been resolved? If the answer is yes, then, then it's probably time to end. It's an end. If they have not been resolved and you've got yourself into an almighty tangle because you cannot work out how to resolve them, then that's going to be a bit of a problem. And that's not an ending problem so much as that's a problem deep within your structure. It's like if you built a house and the pipes don't work properly, there's no point continuing to build the house over the top of bad pipes. They will just leak and ruin the whole lot. You need to, if you are having real trouble ending your story because you can't resolve things and you're thinking and of just killing them off or of, of saying that then they woke up, please don't do that. Please don't do that. It's a most disappointing ending for anybody reading it, especially if they were invested in it. Then what you need to do is to go back and have a look. Maybe your underlying structure is something wrong with it. Your pipes leak and no amount of putting plaster and paint over the walls will help you if you have leaking pipes. Also, it's not going to be very good once you mix in electricity. Not good at all. So, if you are having trouble with your ending, your problem is likely to be earlier in your story. If you don't know how to end, or you, you think, oh, is it, is it able to be ended yet? Then think, have I resolved all the problems? If you've resolved all the problems, then you should be able to end it. Do not just keep building and building and building more problems on because you think it's not long enough. If your story isn't long enough, then what you need to do is go back and have a look and think, are my characters well developed? Have I got enough description? Have I given them a sufficiently difficult task to overcome? That will help you if you think that your story isn't long enough by the time you get to your ending. Okay, so I hope that helps you with your writing. And our final, final question comes from Claudia Swilzaki. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And she asks, how do I get through writer's block? Well, there are two kinds of writer's block. I'm not a big, huge believer in writer's block to be honest. It's not really something, not that I don't encounter it, but I don't like to think of it as a block because if you think of it as a block, then all of a sudden it's impossible to move past. A block is, is something in your way. The first type of writer's block or what people call writer's block is not actually block at all. What it is, is my life is too busy and hectic and stressful to do any kind of writing. So that is a problem. It is impossible to do creative work when you are stressed out about your job or the bills or have some sort of life crisis happening. That is not a writer's block. That is, you have a life crisis and writing doesn't have time. Just accept it, deal with what is happening in your life, and you can move on into a more productive phase once that big crisis is over. And it doesn't have to be a big crisis. It can be a little crisis, but it's whatever it is. The second kind of writer's block happens when, much like what I was saying before about endings proving hard, is, is when, when you've built something into the deep structure of your writing that makes it not want to work properly so that you realize the whole thing has become derailed and I can't keep going with it because the plumbing is bad and it's wrecking the, the rest of the superstructure and I actually need to rip out the plumbing and start again. 
because it's going to undermine everything and finally wreck the foundations and the whole thing's going to go to hell. And then it will meet her infernal majesty and you know what she thinks about bad writing. Oh, that's by the by. But that kind of writer's block is not so much writer's block as the book itself telling you, stop, there's a big problem, a big problem and we can't keep going forward until we address this big problem. And I think the third one, a third one, which is, is possibly what people are talking about when they talk about writer's block, is that they don't feel like writing. They don't feel like writing. Now, I talked about flow in my last video, about how it's very important to cultivate flow because you aren't going to feel inspired all the time. Sometimes you're just going to feel like, I just have to write this out. And if you can cultivate flow and an understanding of, okay, this is how I get myself into a writing mood, then that will help you not feel blocked. But primarily, I would say that if you have a major life happening, the writerly self does not like life happenings and will hide. So you have to wait until that has finished before you can get back to your writing. If your writing has stalled, then look at it and see, is there any structural problems? And thirdly, if you just don't feel like writing and you think you're not going to have any ideas ever again, don't panic create a bit of ritual in your writing life, read, watch book, watch movies, and find, wait for something to inspire you. You want to be, as John Keats said, you want to engage in negative capability. You want to be open to new stimulus, but without actively searching. Much like any form of trying to catch something, you want to be open to it, but not actively hunting. If anyone's tried to take a photo of an animal, it's always when you don't have a camera that they turn up right in front of you, which is why you want to have your camera or have your writing self ready, but not be seeking it out because guaranteed you will waste so much time if you spend your time seeking it out. So I hope that helps you. I'm going to have my tea party now with with my friends and i'll see you i'll see you another time bye bye